Welcome to the Putting the Public into Health podcast by Dr. Richard Pan. As we face one of the greatest public health disasters in a century, this podcast will address questions and issues from you, the public, about the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on people's health and lives. I am Dr. Richard Pan. I'm a physician with a background in public health, and I'm proud to represent the people of Sacramento, Elk Grove, West Sacramento, and parts of Sacramento County in the California State Senate. I want to share with you important information and stories to help each other during this difficult time. The COVID-19 pandemic has been particularly hard on families of healthcare workers on the front lines caring for patients who may be infected. I greatly appreciate having Scott Smith join me today. His wife, Margie, is an ER nurse in Sacramento, and they have two young daughters at home. Because of Margie's work and her risk of exposure to COVID-19 in the ER, their family has had to make difficult decisions to keep their family safe. So tell me about your family. Okay, uh, so my wife Margie is an ER nurse at Kaiser uh, Morris. I'm a stay-at-home dad, and uh, we have two daughters, uh, Grace, who's eight, year old, eight years old, and uh, Jane, who's six years old. So when COVID started, how did you and Margie decide to live apart because of the pandemic? All right, so we saw what was happening um, in Italy and New York, and we saw that that Healthcare workers were, uh, and the healthcare systems were both getting just pummeled. And uh, we knew that the PPE availability was not good. We knew it was a, a novel virus, that there wasn't uh, much information about it. We didn't know much about the short term and long term effects. And then we just tried to think, we tried to project into the future and think, hey, a month from now, what is it that we are going to have wished? we're going to wish we had done. Uh, So we just wanted to buy some time until we had more information and just err on the side of caution. So we had a, um, we had a friend who we knew uh, had a separate guest quarters that she had uh, opened up to people during the uh, California wildfires. So uh, we reached out to her and she said, Hey, it's, it's fine for you to live here free of charge. And so we just, that's when we just made the, made the move. And how long uh, has Margie been away from your family? That was March 29th when she left. Wow. And uh, how is she coping with being apart from you and your children? Yeah. um, She feels alone. uh, She's stressed and she's depressed. Hmm. I mean, she's obviously missing out on so much. Our kids, at their age, they're uh, they're changing and developing so quickly, and uh, being away for a month and a half, uh, obviously, that means she's she's missing in out on experiencing all of that, mm-hmm. or much of it anyway. Um, I know that the fuel for Margie and me, uh, for our hearts, is that is that love that we have for our kids and the love that we get from our kids, and that's what's fueling me right now. But she doesn't have that, so or as much of it as she needs. So I know her tank is feeling pretty empty. Um, she's got uh, significant support from her friends and family. I know a lot of people have donated masks to her. Uh, people have bring, brought her food. Um, I know that um, she comes to our picture windows, uh, picture window at night near our front door, and uh, the girls that I can see and talk to her through the window. We do lots of video chats. Uh, the girls did like a talent show for her over uh, oh. video chat. My daughter Grace does magic for her. We make art for her and send her mail. Um, but yeah, that's I know she, she's had she's reached out. She's still in contact with her therapist. I, uh, so that's been helpful for her mental health during this time. Um, yeah, those are some. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Right. And uh, and then on top of that, of course, she's going to work, uh, well, I assume, every day or uh, lots of different shifts, right? Yeah, she's, yeah. I mean, she's working as much as possible. I mean, as stressful as work is, at the same time, it's something that it keeps her, her mind off of uh, what she's missing out on, too. So it's kind of a catch-22 there. Okay. And how are you coping? Um. 
I mean, I know that our, our situation could be, I mean, I know many people are in worse situations than we are, more dire situations than we are, but that said, it's still a great challenge to us. Like I, most days I feel uh, just a lot of sadness mm-hmm. for what the girls are missing out on. Um, I feel like I'm grieving. I feel like I'm going through different stages of grief each day, <laughs> experiencing mm-hmm. most of those stages of grief. Uh, uh, I know the girls are missing out on their, their, just hugging their mom and being with their mom. So that's, that's just a big sadness for me as well. Mm-hmm. I also have another big challenge for me is I have a uh, OCD. I've been in treatment for it for uh, 10 years. So before this, my symptoms were pretty much, I mean, down to a bare minimum. Mm-hmm. So obviously, with this, it spiked back up, spiked back up a bit. Um, my type of OCD is uh, scrupulosity, so that's basically uh, obsessing about whether a, or any action or thought or intention is uh, moral or not, and then completing some kind of compulsive compulsion around mm-hmm. that, either a mental compulsion or physical compulsion. So that fits right into what's going on right now, anyway, because every action mm-hmm. that we're doing right now really. Many of the actions we're taking have more importance as far as how they're affecting uh, our communities and our families. So uh, that's been hard. To, it's been draining to deal with that and try not to feed into it mm-hmm. while still taking care of kids. And uh, it's just a it's just a big drain. <laughs> and, um, mm-hmm. and you mentioned uh, both, uh, you know, your wife and uh, you are you been able to get uh, support in terms of uh, mental health services? Uh, oh, absolutely. Services? So, like, I, 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 I'm, uh, I have an OCD support group that was still meeting online, so that's mm. been great. Um, we, uh, we meet biweekly, and uh, it's been, that's been a wonderful help. I'm, gonna start, I'm starting individual therapy again. I've been, doing, I've been exercising. I'm trying to get new, good nutrition, uh, meditating, uh, taking the girls outside for bike rides, and uh, trying to stay creative, doing art with the kids, uh, and connecting with friends, and just making sure I limit my news intake too. Mm-hmm. Uh, just trying to do things to take care of myself. So yeah, I, I have been able to have uh, therapeutic support for sure. Well, that's great. We've uh, actually had a previous podcast on the importance of people being able to continue to access mental health services, especially during this time. Uh, oh, absolutely. I feel like uh, being in treatment for so long actually was a i mean a huge prep, great preparation for me during during this type of situation because uh i've got that uh, a great toolbox uh, and i'm in some ways i'm more uh, acclimated to living with this kind of anxiety so uh that's been helpful and how are the kids doing you talked a little bit about some of the things that they were doing and i I think your older one would normally be attending school, except now the schools are closed. Um, so how how is uh, that going? Yeah, they're both um, they're both in school. Uh, my oldest Grace is in uh, third grade, and my uh, youngest Jane is in kindergarten. Uh, yeah, and that's it's been. I mean, that's just another change. It's another huge transition for them to, to deal with. I mean, I'm impressed with their resilience, uh, but it's been tough. I think some of the ways their stress has been coming out. I mean, uh, the youngest has been having nightmares. Uh, that's not usual for her. She didn't ha- rarely had a nightmare before this, but they're now happening more regularly. She'll be in my bed often in the middle of the night. And um, my oldest is just schoolwork. The distance learning is real frustrating for her so she'll just often be in tears when she's doing her homework so or doing her uh, schoolwork um, so we also have support for them we've reached out uh, through Kaiser to have therapists speak with them and give them some some tools as well because we wanted to be proactive about that um, they just miss their mom they miss her really badly mm-hmm. um, they've been it still have been, I mean, we're just trying to get them as much uh, connection as possible with their mom and with friends and trying to get them, uh, get their bodies moving. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been, it's been hard. I just feel like they're missing out so much. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you know, before COVID and having to uh, 
basically stay in separate places. I'm sure, well, you and your wife uh, uh, had your different roles in caring for the children. And uh, now she, unfortunately, as much as she might want to, uh, is unable to to keep them safe, uh, to uh, be with them physically, maybe through a window. Uh, You, on the other hand, are now uh, essentially having to be a solo parent uh, while your wife is busy saving people's lives in the ER. How is is that going in terms of um, uh, the different, I guess, roles that you and your wife are having to play because that in many ways have been imposed on you because of uh, COVID-19 and the need to keep uh, pe- you know your kids safe and the family safe. Yeah. Um, I mean, it means, I'm on, it means I'm on the job 24-7. I'm their, their kind of their sole caretaker right now. And uh, there's no, there's no, uh, really no me time to kind of reboot or rejuvenate. Um uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the girls go to bed, and it's still bedtime. I mean, there's trouble falling asleep. It's still needed then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's been tough. I think not having the support, the you know, not having Margie in the house uh, is a, a huge, huge loss there mm-hmm. uh, as far as uh, for many areas, but for child care in particular. Um just, I feel sometimes like I'm just kind of walking through sand each new thing. Like having to learn new things is just like is, is so much more difficult. Just like uh, distance learning, like trying to learn how to use the different um, the, the, the different websites that we're using for distance learning mm-hmm. and teaching them to the kids and then sitting with the kids during uh, their distance learning because they need the extra either uh, support with the work or just emotional support. Uh, it's, it's, I feel like I'm, there's more energy being spent out than is being replenished. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, I myself, uh, because our kids are not in school, we're doing the distance learning thing, having to be essentially an IT center. They have, oh, this app we're using (laughs) for this lesson. Like, okay, we have to figure out how to get that app and how to get that thing working. Uh, and, and at the same time, like at least I have IT connection, so I'm the lucky one, right? What about the family that doesn't, right? And they're sitting there going, yeah, "What am I supposed absolutely. to do?" Absolutely, right? Um, but uh, but certainly, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure you're. Well, I shouldn't say I'm sure. Uh, Margie probably wishes she could uh, help you out taking care of the kids at times, right? Oh, oh, I'm yes, yes. She wishes. She wishes that's what she wants. She mm-hmm. Wants to be here to be able to help with stuff like that and to be with the kids for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, like I said, it's, especially when they're just this young and they're just, there's so, it's such an important stage for them and, uh, uh, just missing out on that. They're both, both, everybody's just missing out on so much with their mom gone. Mm-hmm. So I don't know when she uh, talks to you and the kids, whether she shares much about what she's doing at work and, uh, the stresses she may be having in the emergency room. Uh, you know, we've heard stories about shortages of protective equipment in some hospitals, although here in Sacramento, we've been fortunate not to have uh, packed ERs and hospitals because people have done their job. They've stayed at home. They've kept their distance. Here in Sacramento, we've actually uh, the one of the lowest rates of infection of any major metropolitan area in the country, but still it is stressful to be on the front lines. Can you share with me anything that your wife talks about in terms of her experiences at work? I don't know how much she shares with you or that you're willing to share with our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, though, I I think many nurses are reticent to speak up and advocate for their needs because mm-hmm. um, they're reading articles and hearing about nurses around the country that feel like they were fired for speaking out about work conditions. And uh, to be clear, this is not what uh, is happening at Margie's hospital. She hasn't seen that at her hospital. Mm -hmm. But when nurses see stories and read stories about that happening in other places, it can make them a little bit scared to speak out. And quite honestly, it can make me a little concerned about speaking out too. But the things that I can tell you are that um, the biggest biggest, uh, concern right now is they're still having to reuse PPE Mm -hmm. um, extensively. Uh, and that's that's just a that's just a huge problem. 
for their safety and for the patient's safety. Um, another concern is that, uh, you know, the hospitals have taken such a hit financially mm-hmm. and they're understandably having to make tough decisions. Uh, nurses would feel uh, a lot more confident and have with, uh, kind of insurances that their safety remains a priority. Um, she's also talked about how there's no antibody tests available still in the hospital. Mm-hmm. You have to go outside the hospital to and pay a, a decent amount of money to have that done. Uh, so yeah, those are those are some of the concerns she's shared. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing those. I know that's something that uh, many of us are trying to work on, but certainly it's a real challenge for uh, uh, the people on the front lines uh, who you know, potentially putting their lives at risk while taking care of their patients. And that's not what people signed up to do. I mean, let's, let's just be very clear. Mm-hmm. It's great to tell people how brave they are to be taking care of patients. And yes, we as healthcare professionals signed up to take care of patients, but we also expect that we would be safe in doing so, and I think it's essential that we work hard to be sure our healthcare workers are safe as they're providing the care that people need. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you and uh, your wife have talked about what do you want to see happen before she can f- come home. So, what are the things that you're looking for that will lead to a decision that now that uh, Marjorie can go home? Yeah. Uh... We certainly feel a lot more confident with increased availability of PPE. Uh, that's the number one. Um, second thing is uh, we know antibody tests uh, don't offer any kind of guarantee of protection at this point. But for our family, uh, we're hopeful at least, <laughs> and that might that they would provide at least some type of protection. Uh, Margie did take uh, an Abbott test last week through uh, an outside source. I think she paid like 120 or 130 dollars out of pocket for that. Um, she still doesn't have the results yet, so I think um, we're going to try and get tests for our whole family. Uh, that's the plan right now, and see if they come back positive. We, I was sick for the whole month of March. Margie was sick for a big portion of that, and the kids had way milder versions of it. So I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who falsely think that they have had coronavirus. So, so this would just give us some more information to make, make our decision on. Okay. And I'm sure that will probably be a equally difficult decision to make in terms of balancing your hopes and fears as you did when you made the decision to uh, live apart. Right, right. There's just not a clear cut. <laughs> right. There isn't going to be a clear cut <laughs> uh, answer for right. that. But we're we're hopeful. So. Well, we're certainly trying to continue to move the science, so hopefully we, uh, there will be more clarity to make that decision. But you're right. This is a new virus, and uh, there's still a lot we don't know. And uh, our tests, as they're even improving our, the test, still uh, leave a lot of question marks, and that just makes it difficult for people. For sure. Yeah. Well, Scott, I want to thank you so much for sharing your family's story uh, with our listeners, and I hope that you can also pass on to your wife, uh, uh, our gratitude uh, from the people of Sacramento uh, that uh, for her uh, her work and her sacrifices as well uh, to again take care of people whether they have COVID or not uh, but certainly essential work in the emergency room and uh, also uh, your children as well uh, so thank you so much for both joining me and for your family's work to be sure that people stay safe. Uh, thank you. I appreciate rec- that her that she has the opportunity to be recognized like that. I know. That if uh, you go to the ER, she is the nurse. There are many great nurses, but I am maybe a little biased, but she's the one you want to see to take care of you. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that, that's a fantastic endorsement. Thank you. So thank all you right. very much again. Uh, and I want to thank all our listeners for listening to this episode of Putting the Public into Health by Dr. Richard Pan. If you have questions or ideas for a future podcast, please email them to senator.pan at senate.ca.gov. Please stay at home as much as possible, stay at least six feet away from others outside, wash your hands frequently, and try not to touch your face. Together, we are slowing the spread of this disease and saving lives. Thank you so much for listening.